Good morning, good day, and good evening to you, wherever it is that you might be listening to this at this beautiful moment in time. Welcome to The Wednesday Wanderer, the show where we unravel the beauty of creativity and adventure one story at a time. Today, I'm super excited to be able to introduce Mr. Steven Lopez. He's a realtor out of Highland Park in the northern LA area, and we dive into quite a few different topics surrounding his industry as far as the gentrification and his efforts to improve his neighborhood with the quality and overall value so that everyone can benefit from the knowledge that he's learned. We dive into how his culture conflicts with his passions and his job and how he reconciles that within his branding and how he shares his message. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Good to go. What's up, Steven? How's it going? So you guys realize this is literally my first time ever doing this. So hey, I'm in the, is the first time for everything. In the palm of your hands. Like, <laughs> so I'm hoping, you know, like everything goes well. You know, oh, yeah. we're not, no, no, no one's going to be disappointed or embarrassed <laughs> by like what happens. But I've, you know, I've never done this. Um, and like I'm aware, it, it seems like podcasts as a as a medium are mm-hmm. really catching on like a, like a second or a third wave of oh, interest, right? Cause absolutely. they kind of launched then like they kind of got dull and no one was bothering. And then they just sort of like, everyone's talking about it again. Yeah. Um, po- see the thing with podcasting is that it removes friction. So a lot of podcasts, for example, I have a media company, Michael mm-hmm. B. Eswell media. And on my media company, I make weekly videos and yeah. I transition that audio into a podcast because not everyone has five to 10 minutes to watch a video, right? but they might have five to 10 minutes while walking their dog or checking their mail or driving to work. Right. So like one of the things I, like when we first started like chatting on, on Shaper about it and I looked at your website, I was like, this dude's totally put together. Like, <laughs> I'm, this thing looks so professional, right? I'm just like, so it's funny because, so I connected with you on Shaper earlier today. I connected with someone like in person a different guy from Shaper because he's working oh, on wow. a, a completely different project as well. Mm-hmm. Right. So he's doing this like 10 K friends thing or whatever. <laughs> so I've just, and I'm going to presume you're like 25, 27 ish, 22, right? 22, even yeah. younger. <laughs> he's 27. So I'm like, this is millennial Friday. Right? <laughs> like, and doing all this, like all this new media type stuff. So I'm like, this is pretty awesome. So yeah. again, I saw your website and I was just like, wow, this is pretty slick. I appreciate so that. I, I think appreciate I'm gonna, like I think I'm going to be in good hands. Yeah, like, yeah. I, you know, I've been building websites since I was like 13, so mm-hmm. I would hope that I could capture some of the attention by now. So what is that? Ten years? You're, you're, yeah, I mean it's ten years. Yeah. I think you know a few things. Yeah, maybe a couple. Maybe yeah. a couple. That's how I used to make money, actually, because uh, my I would make friends that were like my dad's friends, you know, like the other business people. Sure. And they'd be like, hey, you need a website? What's up? <laughs> I, I build those. You're like, here's my little business card. Yeah. And then a lot of my, mostly it was like friends at school, like their parents and stuff. And they were like, oh yeah, my my my, my buddy, he uh, he's good with that stuff. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, what's up? A thousand dollars a website. Let's go. <laughs> very, very entrepreneurial. It's like, oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. You know, whenever I was a kid, I used to go buy candy and go to school. I was that kid. It's mm-hmm. Like they banned selling candy at school because of me, because I went to CC's Pizza and I got 25 cent candy where I put 25 cents in and I got a crap ton of candy. I went to school and I sold it for a dollar pop. And the market already. But yeah, dude. Wow. <laughs> did it whenever I was a kid. It was wow. great. What about you? Tell me a little bit about like your story. How did you get into real estate? Oh, wow. That's okay. So... Currently, I am, I do residential real estate, right? So mm-hmm. I'm a realtor. Um, and that's in Highland Park, right? Highland Park. I work. Yeah, like I like sometimes like off the cuff. I call it the hipster hills. Yeah. <laughs> right. So most people just call it like Neela, Northeast LA, but mm-hmm. it's Highland Park, Eagle Rock, Lasalle Park, Park like El Sereno, just all that like pushing between downtown LA and Pasadena. Nice. So Neela, right? Um, so I also grew up. That's where I grew up as well. Mm-hmm. So. It's definitely one of those things where when I was a kid, like it was rough up there. Mm -hmm. It was really like burned out, bombed out, gangs, 
boarded up. Like it was, there was very little to do. Yeah. Um, it wasn't necessarily the most dangerous part of town, but it was def. there were gangs for sure. But like, not like, like, uh, South central or East LA mm-hmm. where like, it was really bad, but like, right. it was, it was not great. Yeah. Like when I, I kind of understand that. <laughs> yeah. So like when I was ready for high school, my parents actually had to put me on the magnet program to bust me mm-hmm. to the other side of town Oh wow! to get to the better, uh, better high schools. Mm-hmm. Right. So now that I'm back and I'm doing real estate and like the Northeast LA, like those Hills have changed so much. Mm-hmm. I know like gentrification is a very like uh, controversial topic. Mm-hmm. I love it though. <laughs> like, I was gone for so many years, came back and I'm like, Oh, you guys took care of it while I was away. Yeah. <laughs> now it's, there's like every bar, art galleries, restaurants. There's like, they refurbished a bowling alley. It's mm-hmm. the Highland park bowl. And I think it's, I think it originally opened in like 1922 or 25 or something like oh, that. Wow. Right. Awesome. My entire life it had been closed. Mm-hmm. Right. Like just come board it up. You know, just like a totally dilapidated storefront. Now, when you go in, it isn't very big. There's only like, I think there's either six or eight lanes. So it's pretty small, Mm -hmm. but they like did the magical job restoring it. So you get to see all the woodwork, all the fixtures and like the metal gears of the old fashioned, like the pin rollers Mm -hmm. are all exposed at the far end. So you just see all the pins, like, you know, going through the tracks, like coming in my hand and getting set up again. And you see the balls like rolling through. Um, but because it's so really cool, because it's so small, it's really, really expensive. It's like 75 or $80 an hour to pull or something. Oh my God. You know, (laughs) that reminds me of something me and some friends went and did recently. Actually, my last guest, we uh, recently hung out again this Mm -hmm. last weekend and we went and did karaoke at like one of those uh, Korean karaoke things. It was it was interesting, but like they charged sixty dollars for that. Crazy expensive for like two hours. I was like, what? I could have done this in my living room, but I have Google Chrome. I could have okay. just been like, you could have Chromecast it. I could have Chromecasted with more <laughs> options, like in my comfortable environment. Yeah. Too. Like, what's up with that? Was dude? it down here or, or up in? Um, where was it? It was I want to say about forty five minutes north of here. Okay. Yeah, it was cool. I mean, it was an interesting experience. Don't get yeah. me wrong. It was fun, you know. Um, and then it was also coincidentally uh, my anniversary with my fiance. Uh-huh. So that was cool as well. It was three years. So that oh, was nice. fun. Yeah, nice long time, you know. Wow. Yeah. She's over there working the camera, people on the podcast that can't see her. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, it was, it was an interesting, uh, experience. It was definitely like a culture. What's your song? Thing. What's my song? Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm a singer first and foremost. That's oh. how I started all of this. actually. Oh. So like, that's oh. a really hard question to answer, but probably dream on if I had to like, I maybe one. shouldn't have asked that question. Oh yeah. <laughs> I do. I do Fleetwood Mac. Oh, right. Okay. I love Stevie okay. Nicks. Oh, I love Stevie Nicks. Stevie Nicks is like. What's your favorite song? Sh- oh Lord. Okay. So, all right. My, like my favorite Stevie song mm-hmm. is. I mean, it's a, it's easy. It's it's Stand Back, right? Oh, okay. Like it's like okay. her like most amazing single as a soloist for sure. Oh yeah. Uh, but like Fleetwood Mac. Oh man. I, for karaoke, of course, you have to do dreams, but if I had to do my, like, if I really got the choice, I would do Seven Wonders from Tango in the Night. Oh, yeah. okay. That okay. album, that album. But no, I told Fleetwood Mac and Stevie Nicks. When I lived in New York, I lived in New York for eight years, there is an annual drag party mm-hmm. called Night of a Thousand Stevies. Oh, wow. And every, so <laughs> it's always like the first uh, Saturday of May. Mm-hmm. First or second Saturday of May. Um, and like, I don't know, 1,500 people show up, you know, they pack the club in, and all the drag queens are in Stevie drag. Oh my gosh. So just Stevie so It's everywhere. just Stevie drag, and like, you know, they come in, they have like shawls, and they dress like gypsies, and they have like <laughs> fake birds that they walk around like this all night, like the white, like the, par- the, the little parrot at a toucan thing. Yeah. It's it's a scene. It's That's a awesome. to, it's a total scene. It's yeah. it's kind of tragic, but yeah. really amazing. Like I could just kind of imagine that, just like fifteen hundred Stevie Nixes, just everywhere you look. a lot. There's just everywhere a lot. It's all Stevie everywhere. Yeah, just it's a it's a lot. What do you think of the whole uh, <laughs> Mac Miller thing happening recently? <sighs> That's so sad, man. Like it's it's like I feel bad because like it's kind of something that he had was kind of you know 
doing, but at the same time, it's sad because it's so much creative art and so lost. Yeah. You know? So I mean, okay, I don't know so much about him. I know more of Ariana's stuff, mm-hmm. but I was aware of their relationship and like that. You know, she had a breakup because he was kind of. You know, he would spiral and he had addictive issues or addiction issues and that kind of addictive personality, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just felt so, so bad for her that like social media, that that certain aspect of social media came down on her and they were Mm -hmm. like, this is your fault. Like you, you know, that kind of thing. And it's just like. It's just shocking. Yeah. The, the, how low people will go on Twitter or, you know, on her There's Instagram a lot of or hate something. Just social media and just in so general. unnecessary. But like, it's really sad that, you know, so many people who live a very creative life mm-hmm. don't know how to manage their own emotion oh, absolutely. enough. Absolutely. Right? Just to actually get through the day. Sometimes yeah. it really is too painful. Yeah. But other times it's, it's, that much easier to, you know, lose yourself and yeah. either drinking or some a prescription addiction, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. No, I totally understand. Yeah. If, if I didn't live in a state where marijuana was legal, I probably would be on my way to the same thing just because I've dealt with really bad past and anxiety and yeah. like really bad depression growing up. For and sure. Like, even though I stay incredibly busy, I have the podcast, I have my media series where I'm making yeah. videos, I have yeah. my music, my agency even staying busy like you have those days where you wake up and you just feel like you don't want to do it you know and you have to have those things where you focus and have like your why you know as long as your why is stronger than the action that's in front of you then you can you can do anything for sure yeah for sure and I, i mean i totally relate to that as well in the sense that like apart from like my current career I have also been, I have like a huge artistic creative aspect right, of yeah. my life. Like I remember you talking about that. Painting, photography, <clears throat> you know, design work and that kind of stuff. And where can people see some of your work at? Oh, I have, yeah. I've got a full artist website that's got my photography on it right now. Um, it's <laughs> theabstractlatin.com. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I looked at it actually. That's why I was just trying to get you oh, to yeah. shout out. Oh. Yeah, I checked it out right before the. Yeah. yeah. So cool. like, there's pictures from the last big time I was in Mexico City. Some of those photos were on display at a gallery in Portland last mm-hmm. year. So that was like kind of a, a really really amazing moment for me. But that's awesome. Thank you. But like, yeah, just like like not understanding, like it's very difficult for creatives to understand Mm -hmm. themselves. Yeah, right. Absolutely. They will, you know, they'll paint, they'll draw, they'll make music, they'll do all sorts of stuff to express. But like that expression still isn't enough to like quell the hurt. Oh yeah. You know? And like, I've also had like parts of my, my life in New York were really out of control, Mm -hmm. you know? But the weird thing is like, I, I lucked out. I did have addiction issues, but at the same time, like I was painting so much. Yeah. Just I was putting out. It was one of my most creative periods ever, and I mm-hmm. did some. I did something in the like fifty panels. Oh wow. Like, either twenty four by thirty six or thirty by thirty. Like just. Jeez. I was just for this like two to three year period painting nonstop. That's amazing. Yeah. So it was a lot of painting. It was. So it was a very heady, very intensive period. Yeah. So, so I'm like, I'm dealing with what hurts. I'm, I'm like loving the fact that I'm producing so much artwork, yeah, but course. now I'm like drowning the other <laughs> aspect of it because it's, it hurts so much. Yeah. So this whole like Mac Miller thing to get back to that, it's just kind of like, you just want to be like, oh God, like not one more. Yeah. And he was like 26, I guess, yeah. or something like that. And it's just like, it's really sad. And I connected with it a lot too, just because of the fact that like, I very much am aware that my life could have gone one of two ways. And luckily it went a very positive direction. Sure. And now I'm here and doing what I'm doing now. But like, yeah, it, <laughs> it could have gone a very different direction. Just that that <laughs> the road for sure. Yeah. There was, there was a direction change for sure. <laughs> so, some of the work that you're doing is, um, you said you were an urbanist at heart and yeah. you know, you used to hate that neighborhood that was all beaten up uh, and all that, yeah, totally. you know, all the bad stuff. So like, what's some of the stuff that you've been doing to kind of get that going? So yeah, like when I was a kid, I used to, I used to hate that like LA was so much smaller than New York. Mm-hmm. Right. So like the, that urbanist in me type of thing. So 
<laughs> I used to be so jealous as, a, as like an eight year old that like my hometown was like small. Oh, wow. right. Very bizarre. It's right? weird for me. Okay. So for those of you that don't know yet, I was originally born in Arkansas, grew up in Georgia, then lived in Arkansas and then Oklahoma for a while before living in California. So to hear him say that Los Angeles is small, my mind is just blown. Yeah. Like, what? Like, <laughs> what are you shattered. About? Like, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> the smallest city I've ever lived in is Boston, I think, which is like, uh, which is like five hundred thousand people, like in this yeah. city. But I think it's like the population of some of the states I've lived in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, it's, it's a it's a weird uh, correlation. So, but as an urbanist, I okay, like I said, I love the fact that Northeast LA is blooming and booming and. Yeah, it's trendy. I get it. And it's expensive now, but yeah. like, it's a really dynamic neighborhood. Yeah. So now what I'm trying to do, um, I guess as a, you know, is part of my work as a realtor. Um, uh, and since I've had so much of a professional career in design before I got licensed, mm -hmm. I'm actually trying to develop, um, kind of like an agency, I guess, or, or like a business model to help long-term uh, Latino homeowners sort of like revitalize themselves. That's awesome. As opposed to getting like, say for example, well, thanks. Yeah. But, but as, as opposed to getting, say like, you know, you homeowner, mm. I'm going to, you have a very, like, it's a nice house, but it's really, really beat up. <laughs> I'm going to give you X amount of money, mm -hmm. right? Which is a lot mm -hmm. you think, and then you get out. Mm. And then I'm going to remodel everything and I'm going to like put my markups and I'm going to jack up the price and then I cash out mm. because you didn't know how much your house was worth. Right. Like that. So my whole goal is to like these, these homeowners that like they're basically losing out on what their house is really worth because they don't know how to fix it, how to remodel it. Right. Just how to like capitalize on what their house is really worth. Right. Right. So it's kind of, it's almost like that stupid show, love it or leave it, the HGTV, yeah. right? Love yeah. it or list it, love it or list it. It's very similar to that. That's what I was going to ask. I definitely like that show where they kind of like remodel the whole thing. And right. <laughs> but so there's, that's kind of a, a, I guess the basis of it. I'm, that's really know. awesome that you're doing that. Like for on a real time basis, right. you know, not for like some TV show or something right. like well, that. Maybe a TV show later, but hey. <laughs> There you go. Make sure you record it. I know, you know right? documentation. That's what he <laughs> says. You know, but um, but yeah, just in the sense that like you know, like I see some of like the older neighbors uh, in you know, like like the few streets where I live, right? Mm -hmm. Like I've known them since I was, or at least I recognize them since I was younger, and like you know, I know their house is. Like, obviously, like, I know what houses are going for. They may not. Yeah. But in the sense of, like, you know, it's such a um, desirable neighborhood. There's a lot of competition amongst realtors. Mm -hmm. And I know that the, the, the fastest way is to be like, here's $500,000. That's more than what you paid. Get out of the house. Now I'm going to do something. Yeah. And I'm going to charge, like, $950,000 when I'm done. As opposed to you, homeowner, take out a, you know, a more, you know, take out a, a construction loan. Right. Have me as a consultant, realtor, like project manager, let's redo your home. And now your own asset is so much more money. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like you could probably like on your end, probably end up making more in the long run that way. Right. I mean, you know I, mean? I would, I would <laughs> yeah. think so. Like, well, no, it's not a bad thing to say because right. you're doing a good I, well, thing I for mean, the community. I still, I still yeah. need to like make my own money. Yeah, yeah no, for sure. but what I, like, I actually think like the math works out on that too, where by not screwing people over, you're actually making more money right. and helping people to live a better life. That's yeah. what it sounds like to me, which is that, like, that's a great combination. Yeah. That's, totally. that's really awesome. Totally. You know, you were talking about L uh, LA being expensive though. I mean, what is, what can you get for $1,600 in New York? Uh, where? Who? 1600 in New York? Um, exactly. I have a two bedroom in Orange County. Right. And it's, we started at 1600. Okay. So like, it's, it's not that expensive here, you know, like perspectively, like for other places of the world, it's right. definitely not too expensive. Six, six, uh, in, this, in, in the center of LA, like Metro LA, you can still kind of get stuff for 1600 Yeah. in terms of rentals. They're not that big. They might not be that nice. So it's a little it's, bit different in LA. It, it <laughs> may still exist from here to there kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, they don't exist whatsoever in New York unless yeah. you're like living literally at the end of the F train, like yeah. at the far end of Queens. Even I've then. heard that. I've heard like, like someone, I talked to someone before and they said that basically like the kind of apartment I have would be like, 
above like three thousand dollars a month and i was like in, are you kidding, are you in kidding la or in new york like if this place was in uh, in new york they were saying it would be like oh, thousands of dollars. Dude, and I'm like, wow. Dude, like <laughs> this, this this kind of square footage would probably be like almost four thousand dollars a month. That's in, crazy in to me. Just part. because of the location between like, either Man- Manhattan and Brooklyn, something this big would be nearly four thousand dollars, like Jesus. easily. And you have a patio or a balcony, so I can't even imagine. Like I can't imagine paying that much. But like, mad respect to all my hustlers out there in New York City. <laughs> if you are out there. You were grinding in that city. Mad respect to you. I personally can't do it because I like to relax and breathe, and that is what fuels my creative passions. But more power to you. I'm glad you can handle it because yeah. I cannot. <laughs> Super tough. Yeah. To pay that much, but. So tell me more about your art. I'm very curious. Ooh. What kind of paintings Ooh. and photography have you gotten into? Like, okay. I'm really interested. So like that's a lot of paintings. Yeah, that was a lot. Yeah, how do oh gosh, I don't even how do I start on that? So well, how did you start painting? Let's okay, start there. so it started in, it started innocently enough. <laughs> oh and God, that's always the greatest just, story. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I was I was a I was a happy teenager. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was a teenager, but it literally just started. Um, when I was in high school, mm-hmm. right, like LA Unified as a school, Los Angeles Unified as a school district was still pretty good. Mm-hmm. Like they still had funding for arts and music and like that kind of stuff. So, yeah. so I was super, super lucky when I, like I said, I was shipped to the other side of town to go to like get out of like the gang zone. Right. Right. So I went to Venice high school, like right on the beach Mm -hmm. and Venice had one of Venice was one of the, probably like the one of very few campuses that actually had a full fledged operating photography dark room on campus. You know, I've interestingly enough, never actually seen one of those in real life. Yeah. As weird as that is. They're really, they're very exciting they're very, um, what's the word? It, it's almost like, it's, it's kind of like a Pulp Fiction mm-hmm. moment. Like, yeah, because like the red. Like, right, and you have to go through a series of curtains because all the natural light has to be blocked out. And like you got black velvet everywhere and red lights and like huge trays of chemical, you know, yeah. film processing and finishing rinses and all sorts of stuff. It's so interesting. Yeah. Like, because, well, for me, I was born in 95, so it's like, I mean, <laughs> literally for as long as I've been alive, computers have been commercialized, right. so I only really know digital photography. That's right. kind of the only thing of. I mean, I had film when I was a kid, don't get me sure. wrong. Like, was, I remember the disposable cameras my parents used, right. but like, that was my parents. Right. That wasn't really me. I wasn't worried about taking pictures you know, back then. Those, <laughs> things, those things used to be so popular. Like, when, if you went to birthday parties or, like, wedding receptions, like, yeah. they just handed them yeah. out. Yeah. Take pictures. Yeah, and I was and so it, mad when they would fall in water, like, right. accidentally break it because you drop it on the ground and you yeah. lose, who knows, because you didn't develop the film, so who knows what you lost. Right. <laughs> so funny, but... um. Yeah, ours, we had a full, fully operating dark room on campus. So as like a, you know, 11th grader and 12th grader, I was able to finish off my electives Mm -hmm. and we had like this old, old, well not old, but (laughs) you know when you're a teenager, everyone's like really old, like totally old. So his name was Mr. Shapiro and he was this old Jewish hippie Mm. who like literally like (laughs) would crawl off the boardwalk, (laughs) Venice boardwalk, like he lived in some like craptastic flop house apartment, I'm sure. Yeah walked up the boulevard to the high school. He was like, all right, like first period photography. And he like had a big, ugly beard, oh short, totally like, like <laughs> kind of almost, he had a very like Ron Jeremy look. Like, really? Yeah. He, Oh my God. Shortish, stoutish, like <laughs> wiry salt and pepper. Like I'm telling you like beat up old hippie dude, but like, if you're watching the, the video, I'm going to put a picture of Ron Jeremy so, on the screen real quick. So you can see who we're talking about. So I'm telling you like, but who better to teach uh, you about photography than some beat up hippie. Right. right like, of course. Yeah. I'd be super. Right. Sad. Like there were times he would literally like, he'd, he'd, he'd be like, you know, giving lecturing like on, you know, like whatever lighting or this or that, or how to like compose a picture. And he would just be like, bonk. <laughs> <laughs> and he would just stop oh, and he would literally like like I'm doing now he would like look up to the corner of the of, of the classroom and just like acid flashback 
And then you yeah. come back, and he's like, yeah, and then, like, your lighting, you know, and then, like, get the lighting <laughs> measure, do this, like, what? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I can just imagine being a high schooler and just having a teacher just be like, uh, like total. Like, oh, yeah, and then we're going to. That's hilarious. Flashback. Yeah, but again, so he, perfect person to teach you about, like, I hate to say, but, like, like thinking out of the box mm-hmm. and how to compose pictures and, like, weight and light and shadows and just – and it was a very abstract yeah. process. And he really allowed you to not think about, like – you know, I mean, obviously social media didn't exist, but, like, you know, you, he, he didn't want us to take cute, fun pictures. Mm-hmm. He wanted us to take emotional pictures yeah. or, like, weird, challenging pictures, yeah. not, like – you know, you know, like, you know, you and your girls are like, you know, eating an ice cream and like the four of you are like, Hey, like none right. of that kind of stuff. He really wanted you to like reveal yourself. Yeah. So like diving more into the creative more than the documentation. Right. 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 Like, like pulling out very personal, like small amounts of personal thing yeah. bit by bit. Yeah. And then developing like a photo series or like, like a triptych of. That's whatever. really cool. Yeah. So like I couldn't have asked for a better start. Yeah, you know, exactly. very true. Yeah. Like, and, you know, actually, I was having a conversation with somebody at work about this today. I think that that what you just described, having that experience in school is one of the biggest things that's missing from school. today. <sighs> it's so sad because what you just experienced is an experience where you learned how to think and like the, how to find an answer and yeah. how to find a process yeah. as opposed to being told what to think and yeah. being told this is how you do it. Go to the green, right. go to the red room, this up, put it in there, done. Right. Out, like like literally room. connect the dots. You're finished. Yeah. One, two, three. X, Instead y, he like brought you along this, but like, cause he could have just been like, okay, cool. Yeah. Take some pictures. You got to get this many pictures by this deadline that go. Right. That's your, that's your job. Bro. Right. <laughs> like, but instead, like being being uh, passionate about making it about creative and about the story and about actually like making people stop and think like, hmm, if I'm going to do this thing that's going to last potentially forever. Right. Like, obviously, it wasn't digital, so it's still physical. It could, you know, right. it's still got to be precious and taken care of. But now you take a picture that lasts forever. And so it's like you got you really, although it's not bad to take those documentation style photos at yeah. all definitely a place for stopping and taking a second to think about yeah. what you're doing. It, it means, like I guarantee you if you go out for let's just say two months, right? And you take 300 pictures, yeah, which seems like a lot, but in two months, it's that's not a lot. It really not a lot is. at all. Go for two months. And if you break that, let me th- interrupt you really quickly for an example, that really isn't a lot. Like I, uh, that last big time I was in Mexico City in one month I took 1100 pictures yeah, just exactly. all over town when my brother came to visit for like uh, four days or something like that recently we yeah. took 700 pictures yeah for sure So and we went to like five places right. so like, <laughs> you're fine you can figure yeah. it out so like okay hear, hear me out take 300 pictures mm-hmm. so that's how you build yourself a strategy give yourself three months the first two months take 300 pictures for the last month write some sort of interesting content for every single one of those pictures. So like, Mm -hmm. look at the picture. Mm -hmm. How does it make you feel? Think if I'm on Instagram, how do I want to feel when I see this picture? Right. Then write something that is associated to that feeling. Right. It can be anything at all. Right. So you're a realtor. So like it can be based on your uh, locations. It can be based on decoration. It can be based on literally any sort of thing that's in your industry niche. Yeah. And then you just throw some uh, hashtags in there that are relevant to what it is that you're doing. You do that three months. That's one year of content. And you post every single day. Oh, I didn't realize there was quite such a, a formula. It's so easy. Wow. But what people don't do, <laughs> what people do is they go and they log on and they forget that you can schedule content. There are platforms that let you schedule content in advance. Right, right, right. So people forget that and they think that in order to maintain posting multiple times a day or posting even one time a day or once a week, that they have to go in, log on to every single one of those websites Uh, and upload some stuff and come up with content when that's not how it works. You just, it's, that's not how it works. <laughs> no. So I'm, I'm aware of some of those extra apps that help you schedule the content and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, now that you mentioned it, I tried one of them, like that Hootsuite, uh, I guess. 
I have bad experiences with you. So okay, so then I'm not alone in this because I yeah. wasn't I wasn't in love with it. Yeah, I'm not a fan. I wasn't in love with it, and I tried, but at the same time, I, I I guess my own like my own creative process got too much in the way of trying to schedule it out, mm. and it it like it needed to be it needed to be pretty immediate in the whole in the mm-hmm. in the posting process right i get and maybe that's just like the style of work that i do mm-hmm. is 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 a little like visceral i suppose what like do you when, mean by needing to be immediate do you mean like it's like all time it, sensitive content? no more in the sense of like i had a i had a very hard time like like um coming up with captions coming up with like the, you know whatever like commentary or caption mm-hmm. and but a bit like not doing it immediately. Right. Mm-hmm. So like, so I could like, in, say for example, you schedule everything out Monday through Friday, I'm going to do two, two, two or one, one, one or whatever. Mm-hmm. But like, I guess like in the moment something was lost mm-hmm. for me. And I think it was, I think it was just like my artistic side was just like overwhelming yeah. the, the, like the analytical side of it. You know, if you built yourself a strategy though, like I was saying, give yourself three months yeah. you know, even, and you take three months to build out your content in advance. And when I'm saying content, uh, for those of you that are listening, I'm saying generic, like t- timeless content, you know, stuff that's uh, actually valuable to the person that's reading it. Mm-hmm. So when you create value and you have something that's genuine, it's going to offer something good mm-hmm. to the other person that's reading it, then they want to see what else you have. Mm-hmm. So basically you want to treat every single post as if it's the only post that someone will ever see of ever. your content ever. Oh. And it doesn't need to be a sales pitch. It doesn't yeah. need to have anything to do with buying anything. It needs to be giving them value with, and if you do that with 300 photos, that's almost a full year of daily posts Yeah, where you can just literally put your right go whenever you finish uh, if you wanted to follow this like feel free to try this i guarantee you it'll work because I, I i get people to do this all day every day is what i do for work with my agency your actual job yeah my, my day job <laughs> um basically all you need to do if you go home and you write 365 things like anything uh-huh. like just anything like positive motivational things that you can think of that come from you personally with your thought process and your experiences, whatever, you know, and you write those down, Mm -hmm. that's your captions, 365 positive motivating things that uplift your community. If you can't come up with 365 positive uplifting things (laughs) that uplift your community, it's like, you know, it's like, I don't know what to do it because you got a passion, you know? So it's like, I'm sure you can think of with your passion, not immediately, obviously, no, but that's why not. you give yourself three months. Wow. Over three months, that's I don't know. 30, 60, 90 days. I don't know if I, should, I could, if I could take that on as a challenge or just be like, like white flag now, like I can't do that. Like, it's, <laughs> well, see, worst case scenario, if you only get half of it, you have 150 posts and you can post every other day huh. and then you could just post every other day for a full year. Hmm. So set yourself the goal of 365, and if you don't hit it, okay, cool. Hmm. Post every other day or once every three days or whatever you end up with, and then space it out however you need to. But when you the, – the point of having a strategy, if you have a base coat of content, then you're not stressed out about the stuff that you want to put out spontaneously. So uh, if I have a content going out once a day every day, I so, know I'm covered. I have a post going out. So if I actually want to tell you something and give a specific message – then I can go log in on my phone and boop, 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 give my message real quick. And it's not that big of a deal because it's on the spot. So, but so that the gears are turning. Oh, yeah, they, they are. <laughs> they totally are. But at the same time, I'm thinking like, so, all right. Now, how, how do you apply when you do this for yourself? Mm-hmm. Where does your own sort of like creative brain like I guess interfere. Say so say so you, you you generate all this stuff up front and you start to schedule it out. But then like do you get to the point where like let's say four weeks into it you re, you know you completely change your mind like I don't like any of that series anymore. No, you don't. Because the point is it's a base coat. It's but the, still it's the base coat. But even want... even if it's a base coat, like what if does that ever happen to you? Because I I'm see like my gears turning in my brain be like I could do all that. And then five weeks later, like when that, this next bunch is, you know, getting, was going to be released over, you know, week number five, like, mm. 
I don't like any of this anymore. <laughs> or like, oh god, those those you know, what if they you know, just stuff like that. Like, yeah, I mean, not, not that I'm double guessing myself, yeah. but in the sense of like, I no longer like these. Like, whoosh. it's possible, but you know, honestly, I think it's being too romantic with the content. If your goal is to build a brand and your goal is to get visible, uh-huh. then you should be posting once a day, every day. And the right. easiest way to do that is to have a base code strategy. Because like I said, then mm-hmm. you never have to act like when I wake up in the morning, I don't have to think, oh crap, what am I going to post today? Right. I think, oh, what am I going to create today? And if I create something that I want to share with the world, then I can do that. And that is on the spot. But I know if I don't, they're still getting a post. I see. And my brand is not going to suffer because I couldn't come up with something. Today. That's okay. Now that that's You don't okay. have to send it out. You could delete it and send something else out that day. That's if you have an idea a that day. very like fascinating, like... Yeah. perplexity for me because like say for example i i'll i'll go like i'll do like a photo day and i'll mm-hmm. do like i'll wander around parts of los angeles do my my urban my abstracts blah 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 like and let's just say one afternoon results in like maybe like 140 frames or something right, right? let's just as an example so that's a lot to work with already yeah but then some i'm, I'm not even kidding like uh, the following week I'll go back and, and like literally just delete like a fourth of it or a third of it or something. Cause I'm just mm-hmm. like, I don't like them anymore. I don't think mm-hmm. they're good enough anymore. Like, oh, wow. yeah. So, I mean, I totally understand like the mythology met- methodology, I guess, of like giving yourself that base layer of yeah. content to cover yourself for that yeah. long. But then me personally, it'd be, I, I, it's still a very challenging thing. Like I would come back. I very often I'd come back like, <sighs> none of those are good enough or those are boring or I loved them you know four weeks ago Mm. and now see also from my perspective if you make 365 positive things that are providing value to other people Uh even if you don't like them if you don't put them out there then you're denying that value to someone else that's I totally understand because as long as your base coat is create when I say creating value I don't mean just like hope everyone's having a wonderful day the sky is beautiful. <laughs> Life is awesome. Yeah. I'm not talking about that. Like, like yeah, yeah. Cheesy like, meat yeah. level. And obviously that is just what you say is dependent on your niche. But like for me, for example, I just document my process and just talk about what's going on. Like I might talk about what's going on in the photo and be like, oh yeah, uh, me and Mary Lita did this and uh, have been doing podcast interviews. Or I might have something that has nothing to do with the photo whatsoever that's just like hey do you guys know that you can actually record a video pull the audio from it and upload that to YouTube and to podcast platforms so that you create no friction with your content people can watch you no matter where they want to watch you at you just put something like that that is immense value like I sell that for work I tell people <laughs> like I sign people up to do social media and have us run their marketing brands and like give them strategies and we give that information out for free on a daily basis wow. because 95% of people that hear all the information you have to have will never take action on it that's the important thing and whenever that happens you become first in mind oh. like let, let's just do this for example what kind of shoes do you like I am an Adidas loyalist. There you go. Had nothing to do with the store that you're going to go buy them at. No. The first in mind brand was Adidas, so they've been doing their marketing right for you. Since 1999. Exactly. (laughs) That's the way, for the people that you want to reach, that's the way you want to be is... You know, you don't want to ask for this. It's it's like what Gary Vee says, you don't ask for the sale. You, whenever they want it, you're the first one that comes to mind. You're Adidas. Oh, I know, I need some shoes. I need to go to that guy. Because you've been creating value the entire time. That's... I'm gonna have to like marinate my brain on what yeah. you just told me for... It's a lot, I know, it's for a the lot. Rest, for, the, <laughs> for this whole week, and I'm just gonna be like... How do I actually like manage to do? Yeah. Because I mean, I can totally, I totally get what you're saying. Yeah. But I've never, I, maybe I've just, I hadn't personally been in a position where I, I really needed to or wanted to. Well, but what about facts? Are, are there factual? Is there factual? Inf- I'm sure there's plenty of factual information actually about what you do because I don't know anything about real estate. I don't know anything of, like if I were to try to buy a home, sell a home, renovate a home. I wouldn't know anything about it. So literally, you could just start listing off 365 facts about what you do in the industry and what you provide as a service. 
without selling, but like you just say what it is that you do. Like what you just told me about how you help renovate people, like that TV show. Right. You know, yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's like, have you guys seen right. this show? And like, oh. You're like, you connect to people with the things that you're interested in, uh, and it creates value. For them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because gears are turning. I love it. Totally. This. You guys can't see this if you're listen, just listening in on the podcast. But you've you, got the you've, gears turning. You've totally, like, turned my head upside down. Because <laughs> they're, you know, like, I mean, I do a lot of, I, like, other marketing methods within, mm-hmm. like, you know, Northeast L.A. Um, and then I have a house currently under renovation uh, in West Hollywood. So I do some marketing around that. Yeah. Different, you know, means of marketing or whatnot. But... I never, it never really crossed my mind to like, basically, like, if I have to like translate this, it's basically like taking my own job description and like slicing it out exactly into like exactly. A, as many bullet points as exactly. possible. I mean, all like, of that paperwork you send out to clients to give them information about what you do. Yeah. That's all information. That's all content. Oh. You've already written it. It's already been approved. I feel, <laughs> I feel like I'm having a matrix moment. <laughs> You're like literally you're like sh- totally the like all like, <laughs> the digits of the matrix are now like, yeah. like, like appearing in front of me. Like well, it's wow. all patterns, you know. Right. It's just whenever you realize like the number one currency that people can give you isn't even money; it's attention. You know. So like if you have the attention of everyone, yeah. I may not ever want to buy a home. Like but if should. someone's at, well, yeah, no, I, I'm just saying theoretically. <laughs> but if someone asks me, yeah, I'm thinking about buying a house. Oh, you know, I just met this dude. I've been watching his content, and you know what he does? He actually helps you renovate your house and make it better so that you don't have to move to begin with. You should check out his videos, or you should go check out his Instagram, or you should go check out his Facebook, whatever. Right. Know, depending on who you are and what you use, as long as you're present and you're visible, you have a shot. Huh. And it only takes one post. Because even if you don't like every single post, but one person, like like in the right person, likes one post, right? All basically, it's like a bell curve, right? So, all if you look at your Instagram feed, you have your post, and then you have all the posts that are around it, right? So, if this post goes viral, around seventy to eighty percent of those people are that like the post and comment and engage with it mm-hmm. are more than likely to go to your profile and see what, what else you have oh. because of the fact that it's gone viral. Like once it goes viral and it starts getting those likes and stuff quickly, right. then they're like, Oh, what is this guy doing? Yeah. What is he getting? And they'll go and look at it just for that. Um, and the point is, is if you get that one post that goes viral, all the posts around it, they rise with the tide. Mm. And so like then, so then another post takes off and then the ones around that rise. So if you're consistently doing posts every single day, you have this huge backlog of value that you've been creating. So even if it didn't get you anything for a solid year, one year from now, it could immediately overnight go from nothing to everything. everything. Because all of those people may not need anything right now, but a year from now, all of them may need something. Well, which, I mean, that makes, like, the the connection to real estate, what you just said at that very, very end part, like... Essentially, the bulk of real estate is playing the long game. Yeah. Right? Because it's the uh, amount, the, the percentage of people who are like immediately ready to buy mm-hmm. or to sell, like straight away, is very, very small. Yeah. You know, or, you know, people who, people start to think that they want to buy, but they don't know how much is involved in getting financially ready and approved right. and blah, 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 blah. So it's always like, you know, it's always like the, those 30, 60, 90, mm-hmm. and then people who are hit the 180 mark, and then like the 12 and 18 months. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the, the majority of real estate is playing some form of a long game. Yeah. To get it done. Yeah. Okay. And see, yeah. so whenever you're connecting with them, like, it just, it's the biggest thing with the online digital media industry right now is just transparency Mm -hmm. because what happens is is people see that you're providing value on a daily basis and then they see and understand that as you respecting your audience Mm -hmm. because even if you're even if you're just doing it as a strategy the perspective of the other person that's reading that post Mm -hmm. they think that you're really even if you're not I don't advise that you do this ill-wittedly like if you're not actually trying to provide audience provide value for your audience 
if you're not actually passionate about what it is that you're doing and you're listening to this, I don't recommend that you do this because it's going to be very obvious around post 100 that what you're saying. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> around post 100, it will become very, very painfully obvious that you don't care about what you're posting and you won't be successful with it because it will show. It, it may not even show event right off, but it will show eventually because the thing about the internet is everything is out there. Even if you think it's deleted, even it's, if you think it it's gone, it exists. everything on the internet is out there. It's documented and it, that's how it works. Right. <laughs> and when you're constantly putting out positive energy and you're constantly putting everything value out to other people, then that's all you're going to get back in. It's, huh. it's kind of like karma, but on a greater scale because everything's faster and immediate. Like you don't have to wait for right. someone to go home and read their messages and think about it and get back to you. It's boom reaction and that that like that is gold i love that and and it saves you too so like, and how do we know that 100 days is that like potential oh well i just personally don't think someone can go more than about 100 days of bsing without it being super <laughs> obvious because you'll probably repeat yourself right or you'll just say stuff that sounds like you are reading it out of a textbook right and then it's Copying very from super Elster obvious uh, yeah yeah all right I get that. Not necessarily copying it from elsewhere, because if it's written well elsewhere and you transfer it to that, like it's it's fine. <clears throat> but what I'm saying is, is it's just got to be authentic. You know, like if you don't care about what you do, it's gonna show. That that's basically all I'm saying. Like if you if you go to work and you hate your job and you just clock in just to clock in, and that's what you're trying to market, maybe find the thing that you love first. And then try doing it because that will be a lot more successful. Yes, for sure. But for you, I think that like with your history, I mean, like, why don't you talk a little bit more about how you came back from New York and started like what you've done? Like, what, uh, what have you actually done since you've been working on this project? You know, I'm, oh, I'm super interested with the work you've been doing. Let me. Oh, my gosh. Uh, so, wait, you're talking about the house that's currently under renovation. Yeah. Or, yeah. OK. Oh, wow. So. Yeah, we are heavily under construction right now. So the house is a California bungalow. Mm -hmm. So cute little thing from 1920, uh, 1,022 square feet. Oof, that's nice. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a little, mm, uh, yeah. Slightly on the small side, but I'm young and that's nice for me. Cause that's, well, yeah, the way that I look, I'm like, oh, yeah, like, that sounds huge. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, that's so much space. Um, <laughs> It's really, no, no, no. So it's a California bungalow. It is super cute mm -hmm. on the outside and a super huge mess on the inside. Mm -hmm. So over the decades, it had been, uh, you know, chopped up, renovated, sort of fixed, expanded, extended, but like a huge mess. Yeah. And like it, it's this particular house, um, its claim to fame is that in the early 1960s, a very young Mary Tyler Moore owned it. Like when she was, oh, when she okay. was a brand new star, <laughs> okay. she just moved to California or whatever. Um, and she was on her first like big movie contract. So mm -hmm. she bought this house, but, um, but yeah, it was, uh, when I first saw it, it looked like frat boys lived there and it was <laughs> just like horrendous. So part of the, yeah, so... <laughs> I'm sorry, just imagine crap with Right. Uh, so part of the process, uh, you know, meeting with the client, develop, starting the design development process, what do, you, what do you as a homeowner kind of envision to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. So, because even, even if people don't really have an architectural understanding or design background or whatever, but they know what they like. Yeah. I want it to look like this. I want it to have this sort of like, you know, uh, influence or something. Mm -hmm. So we start with that and you start to build like, you know, uh, where we can add on, what walls can be moved, mm -hmm. you know, like what's going to, what from a real estate perspective is going to give the best resale value. Right. Right. Like how do we fix the layout? to make it like look bigger, make it flow better, mm -hmm. you know, and not have, you know, whatever, that kind of stuff. So yeah. You start that part, like, this is like, now we're like six months into it. Oh, it's wow. A, it's a long process. It <laughs> totally is. Um, so How do you really get to know the families too? Like, do you, like, do you get to really work with the people that you are renovating with? Oh, for sure. Yeah. For sure. That's um, really cool. Can't well. <laughs> sometimes it's sometimes it's very much 
your professional game face, and sometimes, <laughs> and sometimes you you know you, know, you treat them like not every client wants to be treated. Right, you right. They all want to be treated in like a certain uh, manner, either super super uh, you know uh, professional, mm-hmm. very cordial, and sometimes they're really chill and they want they'll ask tons of questions like mm-hmm. where did you study? How do you like design? How do you know how to do that kind of stuff? <laughs> right, that happens a lot. Yeah, but this house in particular. Um, which is really small, so we're building a whole brand new master area. Mm-hmm. So we're adding about 300 square feet to the house, oh, which wow. isn't necessarily a lot per mm-hmm. se, but it goes from just barely a thousand to now, now over 1,300 square feet, yeah. which reads a lot better. Yeah. And um, now, like, it, it, it's just it's a huge improvement <laughs> across the board. Um, design process, and then you have to. This is the very tricky part because uh, a lot of people, when when you get to the point where you're almost ready to start talking to contractors, mm-hmm. this is the part that like freaks people out, mm-hmm. right? Because it's contractors are like you know scary or they make me nervous or I don't trust them or I don't know construction. Construction is really really complex. Yeah. Yeah. Super, super complicated. No, I don't know anything about it, honestly. Like, <laughs> whenever we got to build stuff, my fiance Mary Alita is on it. She, she, she's so much better. Not with you. All yeah, no, I'm You're the fine. artist. Honestly, like I try, but it's just it's not my cup of tea. Right. She's so much better at it than me. So I just let her do it. Yeah. <laughs> so that portion, that section of the process is very, very like. There's a lot of anxiety for clients mm-hmm. because what happens at that point is like you, my client need to know everything you want to do Mm -hmm. at this point, right? Right, because once they start. Because the contractor needs to give you a price, Yeah. right? So you need to know everything. Yeah. And and then people start to think like, oh, I want to save a little bit of money so I don't don't want to do X, Y, Z. And I'm always like, let's not do that to ourselves because (laughs) more times than not, people are like, oh, shh. Head, like <laughs> I should have done that, yeah. or it's not going to look as good without it. But I didn't want to spend the money, but now I'm okay with spending the money. Yeah, you know. So it's like, like, well, it's a lot it. of hand holding and like talking them through mm-hmm. and just um, like explaining to them, you know, the the bidding process and how much things cost and how long they take mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. It's yeah. Very, 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 there's so complicated yeah. to get to the point where your contractor is giving you a price and ready to go to the city for permits, all sorts of stuff. I can't imagine, like, I can't even imagine dealing with the contractors, honestly. Like, that just sounds intimidating to me. But yeah, well, yeah, but that's, that's kind of, that's what I'm trying to step in and be like, they, I, I speak their language. Right. They don't scare me. They don't intimidate me. Like, I know how to like, like manage them. Mm-hmm. And I know when they're when they're being uh, either like uh, it's not irresponsible. I guess they're responsible, or, or they're not. You know, they're not being diligent about getting stuff done on time, right? Or like the quality of work, I can spot like you know from across the street, like mm-hmm. they're not using you know suitable materials, or they're like you know right. they're not they're, they're, yeah. like, the craftsmanship isn't there. So like I know all this kind of stuff. That's important. Yeah, that's important. And see, going back to building your brand too. That makes you look better too, because when you know what you're talking about and you know that kind of stuff, you can literally just start spouting off information like the kind of stuff you look for. Like, hey, you want to know how to be more comfortable with a contractor? That could be an entire video that you split up. Pick, you could pull frames to have pictures. I should be taking. You could have audio for a <laughs> podcast. Like that. That'd be a good video idea. I'd wow. Watch that video. That would be a really good idea. I, I don't think maybe I've, we can make it. We'll make it later. Sometime. Maybe we should. Yeah. I don't think I've seen anything quite like that. Like, yeah. I don't think other realtors are doing. So maybe I should stop talking and like. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> hey, uh, it, all, maybe like make you know make it like a me thing only because yeah. you're right. I don't really think I've seen other. You know, uh, either agencies or like you know other brands like the Compass Brands or any other Keller Williams agencies or blah blah blah. That's but, where my agency is starting to become really separated. My digital marketing agency, yeah, um, <clears throat> where we do the branding. Not a lot of agencies market themselves. They do all of this work for everyone else, but then you hardly see them post on social media, or you hardly see they're putting out content for themselves. They're just putting out content for their clients all day. Every right, day. right, right, right. So. One of the things I've been doing is I built a strategy for our team where we're posting twice a day, every single day. 
Yeah, it's pretty awesome. We come out with quotes and uh, facts and all kinds of cool stuff. See, I knew Millennial Friday was going to come. <laughs> really take me in the other That's another one. Amazing, use quotes. Yeah, what's that? Quotes. That's a good, that's an easy cop out. So, like, if you don't know, it will, like, for getting used to coming up with value based content, just find quotes that say what you want to say uh-huh. and then give your two cents underneath it. Oh, quote, subtext, like my, own, like my own spin or application of it. Exactly. Huh. Wow. You literally have like, like given me so much to take yeah. like, the whole weekend. So I need you know, to it do... feels like it's complicated, but really when you lay it all out, all right. it is is be consistent mm-hmm. and be transparent. Okay. That's it. Right. <laughs> right. You stick to this, like once you find a schedule, just stick to it. Right. That's the biggest thing. Even if that is like at first, once every other day, once a right. week, whatever, you got to stick to the schedule. Because if you don't hit those uploads right. on those days, your audience will will fall off. Because oh. people, even if they don't realize it subconsciously, when you follow a brand and you notice that they're putting out, there's a little the if there's time, a lag or normal. Yeah, normally you'll just check around the same time. Oh. Uh, like just sub, your subconscious normally, like if you are refreshing your feed and you check it at the same time every day right. and you're on there, when I check my feed at 7 p.m. and you see if you get the most engagement by posting at 7 p.m. or whatever, right. and then you just stop posting at 7 p.m. and it's 12 a.m., well, all the people that logged in from 7 p.m. to 12 a.m. Mm-hmm. that you normally get, which is the bulk of your audience, right. they're not going to see the post. Right. So, so you put out the content late or the next day, and then they're not there to see it because they were waiting at 7 p.m. Uh, the modern world. Oh, my God. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> it's pretty demanding, but that's why you schedule it. Uh, so you don't got to worry about it. You put out that content, you set it up on that base coat, and you just let it run. This, this is very, very fascinating. Very <laughs> challenging at the same time. Like, yeah. I just... Watch I need to I, I need to learn how to do this for sure, but yeah. it's, it's definitely like I don't know if it's like that left brain right brain thing or something. Right. But it's, <laughs> I recommend you watch Gary Vaynerchuk's uh, content. If you just look up yeah. Gary V E E online on like YouTube or any literally anything, he's on most. Gary V E E. Yeah, you can either just watch his content about making social media stuff for a brand <laughs> for your business, or you can look at the strategies he implements and mm. see how he does things mm. and then just reverse engineer that mm. okay. depending on how your brain works. If mm. you, if it's more beneficial for you to watch the content, which I definitely recommend if you haven't, like I would recommend it because it's what, with what you're saying, you're trying to do like, it would help you a lot. <laughs> Realistically speaking, there is, this, this should be super, super easy for me because tons of, of footage and content to be taken on a construction site to begin with. Like, exactly. Like people would never know that it was all done in like three days and then mm-hmm. like, you know, scheduled out over. You can even just time lapse it. Literally just a time lapse would be interesting. Like a five minute time lapse of it happening. And you literally watch it being built because you have a camera sitting in the corner. All right, on the next house. Yeah. You just <laughs> like, next project. You just set it up and then forget about it, you know? Oh. It's like, let it run for a couple days. Like, there you go. Yeah. I mean, yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so it shouldn't be that difficult considering how much footage I can capture. Exactly. That's what I mean when I say that people over-sensualize the content. Uh, and that's coming that from a creator. Exactly. It, right? And that's coming from a creator. I'm born and blood creator. Like, I've yeah. been playing music since I was like six years old. I built websites my whole life. Right. I've been doing graphic design. I do like video. I've been making YouTube videos since 2008. Like, Is that when it launched? Know, when did it launch? Uh, I don't know when it launched, but I signed up in 2008 and started uploading videos with my... So uh, you were, what, like 15? Who were you? No, yeah, I was, in, uh, I was in high school. Uh, freshman-ish? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I would have been about 15, 14, 15. That was a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> I looked. Uh, I looked nearly much, eleven years ago. Yeah, I wow. looked much different back then. Though I, wow. I was like a skater kid, like uh, super dark because I'm, I'm Native American too. So it's like I get tan really easy when I go outside, and I haven't gone outside in you were totally a long right. time. Yeah, I don't go outside at all anymore because I'm just like you a skate, nerd. Yeah, you skateboard and you sit at a computer. Yeah, exactly. I don't go outside too often. Anymore. Ten shades different. Yeah, but I used to be super dark and. I had black hair because uh, I dyed my hair black 
and I had like super long rocker hair. It was, oh it was great. It was great. Wow. I looked like I walked out of Warp Tour. It was, it was awesome. That that's pretty funny. Yeah. Oh uh, <laughs> uh, man, like the way that I looked in high school was I had a, a very different look as well, obviously. But like I was. But that late 80s and early 90s, like, New Wave and Goth, mm-hmm. and I was, like, listening to The Cure and Depeche Mode and Susie, and, like, I had all black clothes and, like, <laughs> chunky, like, silver jewelry and big, like, the Doc Martens up to here, hey. and my hair was way more luxurious when I was, you know, oh, that yeah. age, and it was, like, teased up, like, that gothic sort mm-hmm. of Robert Smith stacked on back combed and mm-hmm. all sorts of crazy stuff. Well, I still um, dressed the same. I just had the, the hair, mostly. The hair, yeah. right. It was mostly just the hair. Right. Right. <laughs> I call it the main days, the lion's mane. Oh. It's back to my lion's I still got a tattoo, lion tattoo. You know? <laughs> That's not why, but, you know, coincidentally, right. the lion's mane. <laughs> right. Super long time ago. Yeah. So one thing that I'm interested in, yes, sir. and this is a little bit deeper, uh, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into what you do and everything. Sure. So one of the things we talked on the phone about was that sometimes you feel that you're seen as both a threat to your local community and uh, as a local that's trying to help it. So we've talked yeah. a lot about how you're helping the community, but like, tell me a little bit more about how you're seen as like a threat by, you know, the, the community. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, this is a very, very uh, touchy, very, like, complex Mm -hmm. situation. Um, So, again, when I was younger, and that side of town was pretty beat up, Mm -hmm. right? And also, Uh, um, as you're telling your story, I understand that there are listeners all across the country, too. So, if you can, just kind of give some background on the demographic of where you grew up. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Just because some people, like, in Arkansas or, like, where I'm from, may not have an idea of what you're... So... Yeah, so Northeast LA, um, primarily Latino, like a very large portion. Um, Chinese and Vietnamese were kind of like the next minority, um, but the majority of it was like long-term Latino families mm-hmm. since like you know the nineteen early nineteen hundreds, mm-hmm. right? Um, and parts of Eagle Rock had like you know the white Caucasian you know uh, demographic, but the majority of Northeast LA was just Latin, and then like I said, like Chinese and some Vietnamese and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Um, so so they were living you know as I said, the neighborhoods were really really burned out and that kind of thing. Um, what made Highland Park so successful in becoming like hip and sought after and trendy was that between York Boulevard and Figueroa was tons and tons of unused retail space. Mm. Right. So yeah, just all these boarded up restaurants and cafes and just like newsstands, just Mm. not used, just used, abandoned, whatever. So as you know, the, this is probably like probably around 2008. Mm -hmm. I was living in New York at the time, but I would get text messages from my, my LA friends. Yeah. And they'd be like, didn't you, used to live like off of Avenue 57 and I'm like yeah why like oh yeah I just signed a lease <laughs> for an apartment I'm like why would you move to Highland Park <laughs> like who does that yeah. like what, shouldn't you well, what's wrong with Echo Park or Silver Lake like what, what are you doing right like that kind of thing so I would I started again like periodically like oh hey like I just moved didn't you, you know didn't you grow up around here I'm like yeah, yeah. <laughs> what are you doing there <laughs> yeah so that kind of started um, but again, at the time I was in New York, could not have cared less about Los Angeles, like right. less, other than like, why are you going there? <laughs> um, but anyway, so Highland Park bloomed and then, uh, like Eagle Rock, Eagle Rock is crazy expensive now. Mm-hmm. Like you, there's parts of Eagle Rock where houses are not under like 1.3. Like it's re- <laughs> from an architectural point, the houses are beautiful they're really really gorgeous mm-hmm. and you're paying for how gorgeous they are right, right? and location yeah for <laughs> sure um so that whole area like and then glassell park started to come up and now glassell park's very expensive blah 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 but like it became very acceptable in northeast la mm-hmm. to gentrify mm-hmm. and become trendy but on other sides of like the like traditional east la like boyle heights east los angeles like those neighborhoods it's very very like standoff, like literally like, like line in the sand and don't cross 
the LA River. Mm -hmm. Don't bring like literally there's like no white people. Dang. Don't come in. Like leave our neighborhood alone. Super super controversial, mm -hmm. right? Because they saw what happened. Uh, the other Latino neighborhoods are not right. like uh, like trendy white kids, and they don't want it to happen. But what really breaks my heart is. There is a small section of Boyle Heights called Aliso Village mm -hmm. that is one of the oldest uh, warehouse districts of L.A., mm -hmm. right? So it's right on the right-hand si the right -hand side of the L.A. River. So yeah. it's like City Hall, Little Tokyo, you go over the bridge, Aliso Village, right? Mm -hmm. Tons of these old, old, old like brick warehouses. I do a ton of photography down there. Mm -hmm. Really, really fantastic. Um, but again, old warehouses become art galleries. Right, mm. because they're big, they're cheap. That actually makes a lot of sense. Right, <laughs> like, like yeah, they're big, they're cheap. Tons of like you know, massive open space, right. build walls, whatever you want. But anyway, they become art galleries. They're super. They're literally like, so like you cross the river. It's this whole like warehouse district, and then there's a little incline, and it goes to Boyle Heights, mm -hmm. right? So what breaks my heart about it is. The the long term residents of Boyle Heights, all the Latinos, the Chicano families, and that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. they are so against it. They literally were like, they literally take on this like, we don't even want like art in our neighborhood, like because it's a it's a signif signification, a signifier that like gentrification right. is coming. But it's kind of like saying like, no, we don't want art. It's a very like, yeah. it's like a very dumbed down perspective. Like, mm -hmm. don't bring art into my neighborhood because art's bad. Art is going to like increase the, you know, the, the real estate around here. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, are you really saying you don't want that to exist in your neighborhood? Mm -hmm. And so, so, and because like I've studied Even art. if it was like art that's based on their culture. See, that's the, that's the whole like, thing. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be like art from like what you're caught, like what would bring in right. that type of an audience. But like, they, they never, they don't ever seem to think about it in that perspective. Like it isn't a matter of say, for example, like I open a gallery in this old warehouse, like, mm -hmm. you know, in like the Latino neighborhood or something. They just, they never take it as a perspective that, Oh well, maybe I can, maybe I should talk to the gallery owner, yeah. the gallerist, be like, hey, like you know, my brother, he he's like a muralist, or my brother is a yeah. really cool photographer. They just see it as a threat. They never like see it as an opportunity to like get themselves exhibited. Yeah, you know, that's sad. So that's I, sad. especially whenever there's a lack of physical real estate for that to exist, right? Especially in the digital age, where right? It's online, and I I walk a very weird fine line where. You know, I'm from the east side originally mm -hmm. and I, you know, born and raised and saw, I've seen it change and that kind of stuff. And I, I understand like the apprehension of it, but at the same time, like I love Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I love how much it's like, it's in a huge like boom cycle right yeah. now. So I'm happy the city's doing that. And I love the fact that there's a like, whole new art scene, mm -hmm. right? Like there's, you know, there's so many sections around downtown LA that are just perfect for art. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so like me being the artist, I'm excited about it. Yeah. Me being an Angelino at heart, mm -hmm. excited about it. But then there's like, well, you're still Latino. And so why don't you side with us? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, when I was a kid, like I was like, I was hella embarrassed to be living in such a bombed out neighborhood. Right. So for me, like, yeah, like I'm proud that my neighborhood looks amazing now. Yeah. Right. And there's a really cool pub and the bowling alley and I can go get my, I, you know, my yeah. vegan breakfast. Like what the only <laughs> perspective, like <clears throat> one perspective that I could understand from that is if it became too expensive for them to then live there. Yes. That I could understand. But the differences of what you're doing is you're helping them to raise the value of what they have. Yes. And this is, this is definitely, again, so this is kind of the other, the underlying aspect of the difference between Northeast LA and like the other part of East LA yeah. is that in Northeast LA there was, and I found, I, I didn't even know this really until very recently. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the percentage of people who are homeowners mm -hmm. was much, much higher in Northeast LA versus other parts. Interesting. Yeah. So there's like, I guess, I don't know how you describe it like that. The, 
the, the mentality of mm. home ownership is drastically different. Right. Yeah. So like, I don't know, like it's almost like two tribes, like the Latinos up here were like, well, let's buy our house. Cause mm. that makes sense. And then these ones over here were like, no, we're just going to rent. We're working class. Mm. We're, you know, we're kind of poor. Right. We don't have enough. We, we don't understand equity. Like it mm. doesn't, you know, we're just going to rent forever, live in this apartment or this little, you know, a little, little house or whatever. Right. You know, our rent's cheap. We're fine. Mm. So it's, the, 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 the split of mentality is really, really drastic. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's it's so cool. crazy to me that like, it's just hard for me to, to see that, like to understand how you can come from a place, be doing something to make that place better and be seen negatively for what you're doing to make that place better. Yeah. It, it just, that it kind of blows my mind a little bit, honestly, like, and it, uh, to be honest, it's kind of like, comes down to just how people are in general. Like in general, I think people just are ungrateful yeah. is what that comes down to. <laughs> it's like, I was looking for the words to say that, but there's no easy way to no, say that. Really like, is, uh, I, I think that in general change makes people scared for sure. And, um, like I said, I can understand the perspective of being scared that you're going to lose your home. Like if like, I can't afford to live here anymore. Like I'm going to lose my home. But if the whole point is to make your home better, not take your home away from you. Right. Like that's a completely different concept. And instead of like, here's, here's the sad truth. If you're listening to this and you're living in that area, here's the sad truth. It's going to happen whether you like it or not, because that's how society works. It's going to look better whether you kick and scream along the way or not. Like five to 10 years from now, LA will look that way. You either can be a part of that and put your culture into it by grasping it and taking ownership of that changing process, or you can stand on the sidelines and complain about it until it's bigger than you are and you don't have a voice anymore. Those are the choices. So for your own sake, it's better for you to take control and to actually put your culture into that area so that you actually have a voice and you don't disappear. Completely true. Yeah. Completely <laughs> true. That's like, that's what I'm hearing. Like from your story, it's, like what you're yeah. telling me, that's, that's like the ultimate bottom line. You yeah. Know? It's like, that's scary. You don't want to lose your culture and make it like, you don't want to stand on the sidelines and literally watch your culture be sucked out of the place that you came right, from. Right. Right. But uh, it, like the, that first portion, the first portion of it, like it literally cannot be stopped. Yeah. The gen- like gentrification is, is going to march yeah. through your neighborhood. It just, well, because it ultimately isn't a race thing, right? It's people are going to make the world look better, right? Whether the people that live there like it or not. Yeah. Because the ultimate, the greater pe- the greater population mm-hmm. wants the area to look nice. Yes. And ultimately that's what wins. Yeah. Um, it's, one, I think, like, from a geographical point of view for the city, what makes it so, so, like, the, the whole housing issue, how uh, the, how limited uh, availability is, is Los Angeles is probably, like, the only major, major city, like, I'm, like, literally, like, on a global level, mm-hmm. Los Angeles is the only major city that has so much low-density housing in the center of it, mm. right? Where, like, like. If you look at what how downtown looks, right, and it has like the, like the the ring of freeways around it and all the skyscrapers and blah 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 blah, right? Mm-hmm. You don't have to go very far from that, like outside of that perimeter, especially on the east side, mm-hmm. where it becomes like just single family houses, mm-hmm. but within like direct view of like the city center, yeah, right. Every That's other so c- true, actually. Like now that I think about every it, every other city's got like the the, the you know the, the the city center downtown mm-hmm. or whatever. And it's all metropolis. Right. Yeah. And so like the density actually gradually goes out. So it's like really big apartments, medium yeah. condos. And then it goes out to the suburbs yeah. where LA is like very opposite of that. Yeah. So we did ourselves a huge disservice like a hundred years ago mm-hmm. when they just started building all these houses yeah. because there was so much land. Yeah. And now there isn't. They built out instead of up. Right. Because they didn't have to build up yeah. in 1900 because there was land everywhere. Yeah. But now in 2018, there's land nowhere. Yeah. 
So we There's not a lot. <laughs> right. You, you either keep building in Victorville or you come back into Los Angeles, like Metro LA, yeah. and you have to start building up. Yeah. It was the only choice. There really is no other place to go. I'm really interested to see a Los Angeles actually like five to ten years from now. Oh, yeah. I'm really interested because they've been building a lot down there. I've gone down there probably like three times maybe yeah. in the last like couple of months. And um, whenever we went down there, like every time we've gone down there, something's been different. Right. Like they were building this thing, this like iceberg thing for a movie. It was like this building thing for uh-huh. a movie, like some movie that's coming out. I'm not 100 percent sure. Some kid movie is like an animated <laughs> thing. And we go down there and they're in the process of starting to build it. Right. Yeah. We go down there again and it's just done. Huh. I'm like. Who is working on this? Right. What? Like, right. And, and that's why you can't make changes, ladies and gentlemen, because it pretty much happens overnight. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. For sure. No, the next, my my whole, like, 10-year prediction of the city, like, LA is going to be drastically different, basically from now, literally until the Olympics get here. Yeah. So. I cannot freaking wait. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. But, I want to go to the Olympics in 2020 it's, in Japan. It's going to, uh, yeah. I'm planning on I would, I would just go to Japan in general. But, yeah. like, so. We have the Olympics coming, but in the meantime, we've got, like, three subway lines under construction. Mm -hmm. They're expanding LAX, finally. Yeah. Um, They are building... They've approved so many, like, high-rises, like, brand-new skyscrapers in downtown. Yeah. New football stadium, right? Inglewood wants to build another arena. They're remodeling the Coliseum. Yeah. Right? Like, the the city is just going to be on in fifth gear for the next literally the next decade yeah until the olympics get here and then i mean i don't know what's gonna happen after that but these next the next 10 years are gonna be really really exciting to be in los angeles i'm super pumped i um i didn't i like i wasn't alive yeah actually i think i was born that year but the olympics in atlanta they they happened i was born in 95 it was those were 96 ah yeah so i was alive i was a year old yeah because 92 is barcelona and 96 was atlanta so you were so i lived there and like a couple of i think we were like 30 40 minutes north of atlanta the city of atlanta Mm -hmm. so yeah like right there the olympics i remember going down to the olympic park like so many times with our family like every time we went to atlanta and being like oh cool the olympics happened here (laughs) so awesome i was here i was what was this I was eight. Oh, dang. During the 1984 Olympics, which were in Los Angeles. Ah. So, yeah, like, that was extra awesome to be, yeah. like, an eight-year-old and, like, yeah. uh, like all the, you know, the, the flags and banners around the city and, like... And then the culture, too. Yeah. Like, it, that's what I'm excited about. Because by awesome. then, like, if I... I don't plan on stopping this at all. Like, right. to any extent. I haven't stopped since 2008. It had a period of time where I couldn't do it because I moved and I had other right. shit and, like, life came up. You know, it's yeah. like you can't always create, yeah. but that's not a bad thing. You know, you got to have periods of breakage, and you also have to have periods of time where you live so that you have experiences to pull off of to create. You right. Know? Luckily, uh, now, though, like I'm in a point where my creation path and my life path is kind of on the same track. So it's like I get to be happy and live life, but then also create at the same time, you know? Yeah. So I don't plan on changing that because that's a pretty good setup. I'm going to about to be working from home full time, and whenever that happens, content's going through the roof. And so, like, I can only imagine the kind of place that, like, my goal for, the, like, when the Olympics come here, I would have all those people on my show because, like, I just want to Oh, that'd be, be so crazy. Like, that'd be so Like, that's fun. a long way away, and I think that's actually pretty realistic just to be, like, have a good enough show. To some, whatever the medium is, it right. may not be a podcast, may not be a video. I don't know what technology is. Oh, or or like an is. entertainment brand of some sort. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, that's actually that was my logic and my goal for how I built myself. Yeah. I kind of <clears throat> the way that I look at it is, it's like my YouTube channel is kind of like a, a TV channel. Mm-hmm. So it's like you're watching Showtime mm-hmm. or Stars or whatever. And then it has like shows that play on it. So the Tuesday show is a, is a show, it's its own thing. Like instead of having a niche and like just doing one thing all the time, yeah, I only do that one thing on a specific show. So like right. Tuesdays is talk about a Tuesdays where I talk about my life and the stories that got me to where I'm at. 
right? Talk about it Tuesday. Yeah, talk about it Tuesday. <laughs> uh, Thursday is think about it Thursday. Shut up. Is it yeah, really? It is. Talk about it Tuesday, think about it Thursday. Yeah, I like, I like uh, things that sound nice together. You know? What's that word whenever it's like TTT? Alliteration. Alliteration. Alliteration, yeah. That's the one. It's getting late, guys. Just yeah. on our end, it's like 1048, and I'm like, my brain is like forgetting words. So, you know, it's okay. It's been a long day. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I really love alliteration. Uh, think about it Thursdays though, is where we go and dive deep into discussion topics and we do tutorials and the kind of stuff that I do, I teach other people how to do. So it's like, if, for example, the stuff we talked about, I'd be making videos about how to make content. Here's how to use my template to make your own content, like that kind of stuff. Um, and then on Saturdays it's music based because ultimately, like I said, I started YouTube because I used to make videos doing right. music and that was right, it. Right. It was just in front of a webcam playing the songs that I wrote and that was it. That was my YouTube channel. And it, it, it just grew. It, what happened was, is I started taking videos with my cell phone and they started getting better with cell phone quality. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and like making funny videos and just recording stuff and like throwing together edits in windows movie maker. And I just, Loved it, you know, and then when I got this job, um, basically I realized that small businesses and stuff, there wasn't really an agency social media solution mm-hmm. for like mass market social media. Mm-hmm. So I created a strategy for my agency. When I started there, they just did websites and SEO. And then right. I created a strategy where we do Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and YouTube for all of our clients. So we have like thousands of clients across North America. Uh, like in the industry, like anything from like a realtor to like a photographer to a plumber. You know, we right. basically, what we do is we post for them like once a week for an entire year of content and we optimize all their platforms so that everything is native and it comes through really clean and they get a good interaction basically with their, uh, with their people. And like, you know, building those social platforms up and building up that agency, like I learned a lot. <laughs> right. I learned a lot. I've spent eight hours a day every day where other people would be listening to music and just goofing off and doing whatever. You were actually learning. being productive and yeah. constructive. I've basically had a three year education where I'm the boss and I decide what I want to do every day because I develop the strategy. Yeah. I mean, obviously I have bosses. There's the owner, there's the CEO, there's the working managers and production managers and there's people that manage things and have their own says now, obviously. And it's a lot more elaborate now. But like in the beginning, when it started out, it was literally I came to work and I decided what am I going to work on today? <laughs> because I hadn't decided what the strategy was. Right, yet, right. You know? And I would spend that time like working on my strategy and learning social media while I was listening eight hours a day, every day, videos that would actually teach me things that I needed to know. And that's, that's where I learned the power of social media is by watching it and reverse engineering. So like you look at some like Gary Vaynerchuk and the success that he has. That Gary Vee guy. Yeah. And I just found him this year actually. So it's kind of ironic because this is what he's been doing for years, yeah. like years and years and years. And it, everything that I've done for the past three years, you would think I've known about him for a long time. But I just found out about him in January of this year. And basically it was a huge affirmation for me where like I found his content and I was like, holy shit, this is what I've been saying to everybody for the past three years. I was like, this is how I built this department because they told me I was dumb and didn't know what I was talking about. Then I showed them the facts and they were like, oh, social media is awesome. Let's do this. Listen to this kid. Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. And now, like now it's to the point where I basically send them an idea we sit down and have a conversation and it just happens like the next day. Yeah. Because now like I've built that rapport and everything. But I was at that time 19 years old. I had just moved here. I lived by myself. Uh-huh. Like looking at it from even my own perspective, that seems like a flight risk to me. Oh, for sure. You know, it's like you have no loyalty. You have no reason to be here. Your family's all gone. You're barely making any money. Because this thing isn't built yet. You know, obviously you can't make money from a department that doesn't exist yet. So I was doing all this for free. I basically had built up that company for free. I I didn't ask for my name to be put on it. I didn't ask for the recognition. Like now I'm getting it because I'm, I'm making videos for them and I'm the face that people see when they see those weekly videos and they see that content. But when this started, nothing. And I didn't expect to get anything because it's not my company. Right. My thing was is I wanted to develop a solution that helped people. And by what I do, what I created, it lets small business owners to actually afford to be able to do their social media, you know, because it's expensive. It takes your time. It takes your energy. It's It takes a lot, you know, yeah. and especially if you're not doing it yourself. And um, there's a lot of agencies out there that will take your money to basically just – 
go and do really like five minutes of work. Right. And I'm not okay with that. No, the least amount of actual content possible. Yeah. Yeah. For whatever their fees are. Exactly. Exactly. So basically I just created something that is the maximum affordability. So it's like, it's the lowest price that it can be, Mm -hmm. but maximum amount of results. So you actually end up ranking for like the keywords that you select and you show up and you get interactions and you get engagement. And it's like, you actually get what you should be getting with your content, you know? Um, that's just, that's just ultimately my passion is I'm a creator. You know, like I, like I said, I created that department at that company and luckily now they've, they've shown me back the appreciation sure. for the time and effort that I put in. But definitely, like well, now I it's mean, definitely the, a business the, story. But the like, talent is pretty evident. Uh, yeah. I appreciate it. I appreciate well, it's true. Like, <laughs> this, this whole setup and all that, like, you know, like I said, like just seeing your own, you know, media, like website itself. I was just like, this kid is really got it like put together. <laughs> I appreciate I'm it. Gonna be I can't take good. any of the credit. Like I said, it's eight out. It's, I learned this from other people. Like, that's why I'm saying you need to be putting out value content. You know? oh, going back that's, that. where I that's where I learned. That's how <laughs> I, I know. know everything. I know. Everything that I oh, am that's is such because a challenge. people did that for me. I know, I know, but I know that you're right. I'm just like, how am I actually going to like get my brain to do it? Okay. Well, here is more content ideas. Uh, throwing out more ideas all right. Me. All right. Go gentle. What about, me. Go gentle. Cause what about reasons? Like, okay. What would you tell me if I am a Latino person in your community that is against this whole gentrification movement? And I'm telling you, this is some BS. You're trying to take away my culture. I hate what you're doing. What are you going to tell me? Wait, whoa, change whoa, whoa. <laughs> what are you going to tell me that's positive to change my mind? To get me to think about the things the way you're wanting me to think about them. When that's my opinion, what what are you telling me? Oh, man. Um, that is that's such, that is such a loaded question. Yeah. I would probably say, like, they're my, – my, gut gut it like responses and it's 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 a little bit crude but it's like <laughs> just and I've I have I've, I've shared this with other people but like just because you are latino mm-hmm. right doesn't mean you have to live in the hood yeah doesn't mean you have to live in the ghetto you don't have to live in squalor right mm-hmm. like you can still live here there's no reason for you to live in such disrepair. Yeah. Right. Like there are better ways mm-hmm. of staying in your neighborhood, beautifying your neighborhood yeah. and actually like being in a place that is, you know, that you, I mean, you, it's, yeah, no, yeah, that's it's, a good answer. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It is, I mean, so, basically, it just boils down to like, just because you were born in this neighborhood, it is, yeah, it's your home, but like, you don't have to live in the ghetto just because you are a Latin, like Latin minority. Yeah. At all. Yeah. That's, that's kind so, of pre-described and it doesn't mean you have to like actually subscribe to it. Exactly. Yeah. You just don't. See what you just said, that like you could write that out as a business statement for your social media brand. Shit. Oh man. I already feel the controversy. Like, I mean, <laughs> well, I mean you can refine it, but basically yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. that is a solid platform for building a brand. Oh, I'm going to have to really pr- choose my words very carefully for that. But uh, you, I know you're, I know you're right. I know you're right. What you do is you don't make it about like you it's, there's a fine line between going against someone's opinions and their beliefs. Yeah. And providing information so that they can have more information to live a better life. Yeah, right? yeah. Because you're coming at them from understanding their perspective because you've lived it. Other people are trying to tell them the same thing, but they have no idea what they're talking about because yeah. they haven't lived it. Yeah. So you can tell them, hey, I understand. This is this is my story. This is what happened to me. Here's why I believe this. Like literally every day you could share, here's three tips for why you should be upgrading your home. Here's... Uh, here's why I believe it would be better for this neighborhood to be better overall. Here's this, here's that, you know, it's like in literally you just get in front of a camera and you give your opinion and you like, like you just did, you know, you scooted up and you had like a serious moment with like (laughs) this fictional person, you know, it's just like, like that's literally all it is, is you, you picture that camera as a person because ultimately when you're, when you're making content, you're making it for that one person. Right. Because you may have 1 million followers, 
but that is so, 1 million individual people. Like you got to think me, mm-hmm. there's three people in here right now. Right. And it would be a big deal if you told me like, Oh, like you saying you looked at my website and stuff like that's awesome. That doesn't happen every time. That's awesome. You know, right, right. And that's one person, and like every single view, every single click is another person like you or another person like me that ha- is doing all of this other stuff. When I look at your website, it means something because I'm taking time away from everything else right. that I have going on so that I can pay attention to your stuff. And mm-hmm. people don't recognize that they they look at it as thinking that there's me and then there's them, but in reality, it's the, it's all of us. Like we all use social media the same. We all have lives. We all go and we do our stuff. Right. And then we give our attention to the people that we respect and that we follow and we believe in. We're interested and curious about and believe in. and Right. Yeah. Huh. It's just a matter of connecting. Yeah. (sighs) When you think of your audience as a person and not as a number on a scale, that's where your content is going to blow up. Oh, wow. Another Matrix moment. Yeah. Because ultimately, this is well, too much. You just have to like. <laughs> it's really not though. You know, ultimately, it's just thinking about like when you're scrolling through your feed. Why do you stop and read something? Mm. What makes you double tap on that picture? Like, why? Why do you open up your phone at all and go to social media? Well, part of it is the. Um social media addiction, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you're right. Like I, you know, and it's different. It's definitely different. Um, like impulses, right? Mm-hmm. Like some of it is really like a really, you know, the, the photo itself is really, really good. Or sometimes it's, you know, the very generic, um, you know, my, my, my friend's family type of thing, like, Oh, she, she took the two kids to the park and you just want to let them know that, socially passive, yeah. like, Oh, I saw your photo with like, you know, the two kids at the park. Right, and stuff right. Like so it's that very bizarrely like late and passive <laughs> connection. Mm-hmm. Oh, Steven really liked, you know, the picture of the, you know, the boys on the slide. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. That's great. Even though we haven't actually like, like verbally spoken right. in months or, you know, just, yeah, there's, there's a lot of different impulses. Well, I'm saying more so with a brand, like not, not with your friends and the people. Oh, like, like with, with a the brand. brand. Yeah. Um, so if, if I have to take this back to like, all right, if we, if we take this to like Adidas or something, yeah. right? Like I, like you're chilling on the explore page. Right. What, what do you tap on? Like, why are you interested in content? Like what makes you actually care about something that someone has to say? I don't Oh my God. How do I, it's, it's really weird for me to answer that. Cause in a lot of ways, if it's Instagram, it really just comes down to like, artwork, mm-hmm. you know, or again, like, like the narrative of an, of art or the, you know, like the, the mood of it, yeah. like that. So I don't know if that's the greatest answer, but that's a good answer. Cause you can make another Instagram page. Like you can have as many Instagram pages as you want. You don't have to have just one. Right. Right. So you can make an Instagram page that is centered around art for real estate. And so it's all the decorational art that you're going to put in your homes. You know, and you feature artists from all around your area. That is, oh, and then that's actually the fastest way to grow engagement too, because you're collaborating with your community, and then you're giving other people a brand place to shout out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I've kind of tinkered with that idea a little bit earlier this mm-hmm. summer. Um, you can even sell it on your web. Like you can have the actual photography, like like yeah. the things that you would buy at the gallery. Yeah, put them on a website. So that's an extra income stream that can, you give part of it to the creator and then you have part of it mm. and there you go. Yeah. It's like, and that's also giving value because that in and of itself is just like my podcast. Although yes, this podcast is a little bit selfish because it's, well, cause <laughs> yeah, right. the, well no, seriously. Cause at the end of the day, it's my passion that I want to follow. Right. Like you wouldn't have been here if I wouldn't have reached out to you and said, Hey, I want to do this. Do you want to do this? Right. And so it's like taking forward that action to do it is what, kind of separates it, you know? Yeah. Um, but like, I don't know. It's just, it's a lot, you know? Yeah. I, I yeah, I had tinkered with that idea of, uh, pers- like, cause I do, I do have two instas, two Instagrams. Mm-hmm. One is my long standing, my own art and personal art and uh, yeah. photography. Right. I saw like, that one, I think. Right. 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 But I, then I have like the, the, the real estate one, the KWDTLA mm-hmm. and 
I had been realizing it's a little monotonous, just like housing can be a little monotonous. Yeah. And then I started to boot, you know, to include more, uh, certainly when we were really got under construction, but then I was starting to tinker with, um, like the, the, the decorative part of home ownership mm-hmm. yeah. is something I need to, and you then can like, even do a niche around yourself. Like what I would recommend you do is since you have your stuff set up through your realty, you know, your realtor and like that's, yeah. Like through, you have to have the realtor name and like all that stuff right, 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 associated right. with it and everything. I would recommend that you build a brand just around yourself. Yeah. Like as what, like this daily content that I'm talking about, I would recommend that you build it around yourself. So yeah. that way, whenever they see it, they're not looking like, for example, my company's name is at IQ. So it's like, you're not looking at what at IQ is doing specifically. You're doing it, what the members of that IQ are doing. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Cause whenever you do that, for example, like someone watches the videos as opposed to just reading our content on social media, you're actually connecting with a person and the life of a person, right? And so it's a lot more trustworthy for a person to say, this is what you should do and this is why. And this is why I feel that way. And now you can understand my perspective as a person. But if it's just a post, it's the same thing in reverse is what I was talking about earlier. The other, the person that made the post, when they get all the likes and the engagement and stuff, they just uh-huh. see those as numbers most of the time. But the people on the other end, at the same time, when they see that generic content coming through, it's just another brand post to scroll past. It goes both ways. So matrixy. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it, like I said, it's all transparency. Yeah. You know, it's like literally once you learn how to like see where things are connected with online media, that's the, the easiest trick to like building a brand. Got it. You just, you, you look at the strings, you know, cause it's all there. You've got all your content. I mean, how long have you been on social media? Oh, when did Friendster start? Yeah. So there you go. That's at least like, I think 10 years of case studies that you can pull. Wow. Okay. Across multiple platforms. Right. At different <clears throat> times of life, at different things that you're marketing out there. Yeah. Like there's a lot, you know? Yeah. Tons. Yeah. Cool. So we're rounding up to the hour and a half mark. Do you have anything specific you want to shout out? Uh, you know, any, any names of any projects you have going on or social, some of your social media or anything like that? Oh my gosh. Uh, what can I tell you? So I've got the, my artist website again, mm-hmm. right? So that's the abstract Latin.com. And all of these links will be in the description below as well as his realtor information. Yeah. And, um, so there's that, um, I've got the separate Instagram for all my, uh, my real estate work as well. Mm-hmm. So I guess that will be listed as well. Um, it's what's the handle on that. So it's Steven dot Lopez dot K W D T L A, which is a broker drama man in downtown Los Angeles. Right. So that's where I feature like all, you know, the houses either I'm, um, uh, uh, working with buyers on or with other agents, the construction project, all my design, sort of my design projects and mm-hmm. that kind of stuff get featured there. Um, and that is also, um, very much in development, very mm-hmm. much like brand development is, yeah. is what I'm working on yeah. as well. Like that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, cause I've, a lot of the design stuff right now is, is just been, you know, network word of mouth, Mm -hmm. you know, from homeowner to homeowner, like that kind of thing. So I'm like really now that you've given me like so many things to think about, but in terms of like really solidifying that specific like element of Mm -hmm. my work of my life, like putting that together into like one, um, I do actually have, um, I have like my tagline. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. What so, is that? so because, <laughs> yeah. So because of where, where I live and where I work and all that kind of thing, like that part of LA is tons and tons of Hills. Yeah. So all my marketing materials get closed out with which Hill do you live on? Hey, right. Right. Okay. No one else uses it. <laughs> Copywritten. That's awesome. Yes. I like that actually. Which Hill do, which you, hill live? do you live on? Yes. It's so presumptuous. Right. It's like presuming that you're just going to do right. it. Right. I like totally. it. I like it. Yeah. That's clever. It's, That's it nice. is. How long did it take you to come up with that? Just curious. Um, it took, oof, I don't know. Most of, well, as a process over the course of summer doing marketing materials mm-hmm. and postcards, like it kind of, 
There were a number of like campaigns I did yeah. before I really settled on. I was like, which one? How did you figure? Like, I only ask because that's one thing that I've never really been good at is taglines. Like, how did, oh. like, so like, what was the process of figuring that out? I I realized that I had uh, I had told a number of different families, different buyers, mm-hmm. um, things about like. LA has a lot of hills or mm. I had this one couple who had their heart set on this one specific house in Mount Washington. They mm-hmm. were like, Oh, they wanted it so bad. It's so charming. It's so this, it's so that. And like they got outbid in a heartbeat. Oh, right. Okay. Like, it, like, the, <laughs> like the competition for that house was literally like a bloodbath. It was oh, a bloodbath. <laughs> and I just said to him, I was like, listen, like we're, you know, we're in LA. I'm like, there are a lot of hills in this city. Like, we'll find you another hill. Right? So over the course of summer, I was like, how do I put this together? Like, and I started to think, like, I told them, and I was like, which hill do you live on? Yeah. There it is. That's that's clever. Yeah. So it just kind of came to you. It, it was, if yeah. it kind of it, it formulated itself yeah, over, right. over a few different conversations. That's but I was like, clever. yeah, which hill do you live on? I find that the best things kind of come like that. Honestly. Right. Like every song that I've ever written has come from me just sitting down freestyling and turning on the, the recorder. Right. And then like later on I go back and I listen to like an hour of me just randomly playing and I'm like, Oh, that sounds good. Let me write that down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then it becomes a song. You know? Yeah. It's a very similar process then. So, yeah. yeah. That's what you got to do. You know, you got to get it out there. Yeah. Well, it's been amazing having you on the show, Stephen. Thank you so much this for coming. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, dude. Now you've done a podcast. Yeah. You can't say that you haven't done a podcast now. That you'll never be able to use those words. Right. How's right. that feel? Well, I'm a little. Well, I, I mean, I might use. I'm kidding. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. So you know, make someone feel good. Be like, oh, this is my first podcast. Right. I've never done this before. I've never done this before. Yeah. What about the Wednesday Wanderer? What? What is it? What? Who? Who? I don't know what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah. I, I've never been to Orange County in my life. I I don't know, don't know what happens down there. Oh, yeah. At all. Well, you guys have a wonderful day, evening, night, whatever time it is, wherever you're listening to this. We'll talk soon. See you next time. If you like this episode of the podcast, please be sure to subscribe so that you can be notified every single week of the new episodes we release across every single platform, whether that be YouTube or any podcasting platform that you might consume those on. You can see the video for this episode on any native platform where video might be hosted, where you can like, comment, and share so that you can help build a community and allow more people to see this that might not see it otherwise. Links to all the products that I use to make this content and anything that we talk about specifically in the episode are down in the description below, so you can check in the link section and find out more information about Steven and find out more information about everything that I have going on right now. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you back here next week for another episode. Bye.